welcome everybody to this session, The Plastics in Our Waterway. This is a collaborative project of RIO, the Rideau Environmental Action League in Smith Falls. This organization has now 31 years of history and has been doing action-oriented projects in the area. Uh, it is a collaboration of uh, RIO and the Rideau Roundtable, which is actually an outcome of the biodiversity study of the Rideau uh, by the Canadian Museum of Nature in 2002. Uh, the mission is basically focusing on conservation, uh, highlighting nature, and uh, as well as advocating education, enjoyment for the waterway, uh, as well as uh, advocating for proper governance of the Rideau. Uh, this session is part of the Journey to Sustainability Workshop of Rio. Um, the round table is lucky to have many passionate and gifted people involved. One such person is Max Finkelstein. Max is Canada's can-do man, an outstanding leader, educator, and writer on Canada's natural history and nature conservation. He is to host a world record of paddling from Kingston to Ottawa in 22 hours. He is an award-winning interpreter. In 2015, he was named as one of Canada's top 100 explorers by the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. And in 2017, the prestigious Nature Inspiration Award of the Canadian Museum of Nature. As a key mentor on behalf of the Read Around Table, I'd like to ask Max to introduce the speaker for tonight. Max, all yours. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm really honored to introduce uh, Jake Wilson to you. Jake's on the right, upper right hand of your screen. Um, I met Jake about a year ago uh, when we interviewed him for the job of running Rideau Roundtable's Big Canoe Interpretive Tour Program. And my role was to mentor him as a, a big canoe leader and an interpreter of the Rideau waterway, its history, its ecology. Um, and, sir, and so the way to do this in my way of doing things was to just get him out paddling on the river. And during several paddling sessions, I really felt Jake mentored me more than I mentored him. Uh, I really soaked in his philosophy of living better with our environment, his ideas about communicating this philosophy, how he really lived this way of life, and how his dedication to just a better way of living in harmony with all our neighbors, finned ones and ciliated ones and winged ones and multi-legged ones. Um, so hanging out with Jake, who he just graduated from Algonquin College Outdoor Adventure and Naturalist Program, has really given me a lot of hope for uh, fixing up our messed up world. So after that introduction, Jake, it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you, Max. All right. Well, it's been uh, definitely a pleasure working for the Rito Roundtable. You've all been so helpful in mentoring me and helping me get started at coming out of college. So thank you very much. And without further ado, we can get started on our plastics presentation. Can I just make one comment? We have with us here Eric Schiller, who is a retired professor from the University of Ottawa and is quite an expert on water pollution. Um, so I'm honored to have Eric Schiller here too. Welcome, Eric. <laughs> and also towards the end, we will introduce the Journey to Sustainability Committee as well. As a reminder, if you have questions, please use the chat box to uh, write down your comments and questions. Okay, here you go. Back That's to Jake. This is being recorded. Mm -hmm. So if you don't wish to be on the recording, you can, you can turn off your video. So thank you everyone very much for joining us for our presentation today of plastics in our waterways. Can everyone see the screen just fine? 
yep. working well? Okay, good. All right. So this is what our the flow of the presentation will look like. Um, first, we'll look at the gifts our waterways provide for us, why it is important for us to conserve our waterways from a basically a human perspective. Then we will get into a major challenge, of course, that our waterways are fighting are facing today, that is plastic pollution. So we'll do this in two parts. Part one will be plastic pollution in general, and which I got very connected to this issue as we did our shoreline cleanup last fall. And then as I researched the issue, I got even more connected and just got to see the magnitude of what it was. I really didn't have a good idea of it before this. But anyway, I'll talk about some of the things I found and the impacts that this garbage, this plastic specifically, is having on our freshwater and ocean ecosystems. Then I'll talk about some simple and effective ways we can reduce plastic waste and keep them out of our waterways. And then the part two will be focusing specifically on microplastics, plastic microfibers. Because in researching the effects of plastic on our waterways, it is becoming very, very apparent that microplastics and microfibers coming from our clothing are playing a big role in wreaking havoc on our on our on the ecosystems in our waterways and our oceans. And then, so we'll have an opportunity to ask questions halfway through after we do the initial um, plastic pollution in general, and then we'll have another opportunity to ask questions at the end, and then we'll have some announcements as well for you. All right, so first let's start with what do our waterways provide for us? How do we rely on them? And the gifts that our waterways provide for us are really innumerable. Our lives are completely inseparable from our waterways. The health of us is inseparable from the health of our waterways. So here are some of the examples of what they provide for us, but by no means is it limited to this list. So right now, they provide us with clean drinking water. I'm, we're I was very fortunate to be, whenever I was camping in our outdoor adventure program, we learned that all we had to do was pick, take a bottle of water and boil it for 10 minutes, and then it's safe to drink no matter where we get the water from. Well, with limitations, maybe if it's coming out directly out of a city storm sewer, you don't want to, but out in, the, out in the wild, at least, wherever you get the water, you can boil it for 10 minutes and then you can drink it. Um, but of course, this is reliant on plastics and chemical pollution not being in the water, just by biological pollution. And then there's the water for cooking, which is the same for steaming, boiling, and mixing. It is provided safely by our waterways. Right there. Is that a picture? And then, of course, there is cleaning. Washing dishes washing our clothes, washing our house, washing our bodies, removing our pollutants like our wastewater. And to give you an idea, I'll, I have this big camping jug beside me to give you a little, about, uh, a little bit of an idea of how much water each of these things use. So a toilet flush, six liters for a modern toilet, up to 23 liters for an old inefficient toilet, which is the equivalent of this five gallon water jug which the is the typical size of the camping water jug that we bring along with us. And then there's a dishwasher load, which is also a five gallon water jug and a laundry machine, which is up to, which is about six or seven of these big water jugs. So of course, this is all reliant on our water being clean. And just why am I telling you all of this? Just, just to get, give you an idea of how much our livelihood relies on our waterways and in order to keep reaping these benefits we must uh, our water must remain clean and unpolluted and especially when it comes to food so we use water in plentiful quantities for our irrigation our waterways provide the water for our animals who drink the water and the plants um, which soak it up and a lot of the water goes into uh, washing and processing our food not only in the growing and this water should be fairly clean as it's when it's creating our food. So a lot more water goes into our food than we might realize. According to the US Geological Survey, one loaf of bread or one pound of bread 
takes approximately 35 gallons or sorry, 35 five gallon jugs, 35 of these things, which is pretty substantial. One orange takes two of these to create one cup of coffee would take around six and one potato takes around 20. So the water, the water ways provide clearly a lot of our livelihood, especially in the means of our food. Not only that, but our waterways provide habitat for the food we get from our fresh water, from the ducks and the fish as an example. And the cleaner the water is, the healthier these animals will be and the healthier our food will be. And also our terrestrial water life, uh, wildlife. Actually, 70% of all terrestrial species of animals rely on the shoreline at some part of their life cycle. And this is why the shoreline is referred to as the ribbon of life. So if we have a lot of plastics polluting that ribbon of life, it can cause a lot of issues for the terrestrial wildlife, especially the terrestrial wildlife, which we eat as well. And then we have the people's jobs, which are created by our oceans and by our waterways of shipping and fishing. And especially in order to keep our fishing jobs, we must preserve our fish populations, which means polluting less. And then there's the exploration and recreation of boating, canoeing or kayaking and swimming. And of course, we want clean water to do all of these things. And let us not finally forget the amazing feeling of just being by the water, whether we live on it, whether we visit it often at the cottage or spend time in our waterways. We just want to be by the water because of its calming effect and its beauty. And in order to keep this benefit, we have to keep this water looking nice and feeling nice. So in order to keep these benefits, we have to protect the quantity and quality. So we can clearly see that our livelihood relies on the health of our waterways, but there are some major th uh, challenges threatening our waterways. And the many, these many benefits could be in jeopardy if we don't take care of it properly. So. Now I'll look at some of the challenges of plastics in our waterways, what, what this challenge presents and what we can do to help. Like I mentioned, I've grown very connected to this issue in this internship position I've been in with the Rito Roundtable. Specifically last fall in October of 2020, I conducted a shoreline cleanup project as well as did a whole bunch of research for it. And in this research, I especially got an idea of how big this issue was. So this was the first project. So this was our shoreline cleanup project took four days in October. On the left, you can see the days of uh, the community members who got involved on day three to help in this cleanup by Voyager Canoe. And on the right, you see the collection of garbage, which was um, so graciously weighed and the data was brought to us by Vanessa Bernicke of the municipality of Smith Falls and gave us the, yeah, the data for the results of our project. So on day one of this project, this is the route that I followed around Smith Falls in what's called the Swale. You can see the yellow route is the route I took by Voyager Canoe and, or not, just by regular canoe and then hot, uh, circled in red is where the hot spots were. So I found the hot spots by um, underneath the bridge by the park and also by the roadway. And then here was day two. The route we took was highlighted in yellow. And again, the hot spots were really by the roadway. And by day three, it was incredibly apparent. We took this route around. Um, Lower Reach Park in between Old Slies and Combined Lock Stations for those of you who are in the area. And again, you can see on the right side by the roadway was where the hot spot really was for all the garbage that we were collecting. We got most of it from this area. So on the final day, I decided to um, stick exclusively to where the roadway meets the water. And in these two areas, I managed to, well, let the figures speak for themselves in this next slide here. But by now it was very clear that, yeah, this was where I was gonna find most of the garbage. And so here in this chart, you can see on day one, 
just have to move my thing out of the way here. On day one, we got 61 pounds in total. Day two, we got 80.5 pounds in total. And day three, we got 60 pounds in total. And on day four, we got almost 200 pounds. So half of the garbage collected over the entire, um, over the entire cleanup project was collected on that last day, the same amount of time each and every day. The, uh, the most or half of it was collected on the day four. So here's a article you can look up that's online published in the Ottawa Valley Insider by Evelyn Hartford to see some published results of our shoreline cleanup project. And so this brings us to obviously the plastic of uh, the problem of plastic pollution. But like I mentioned, I had always heard about it. I always knew it was an issue, but it wasn't until I got out there and really started picking it up, researching about it, that I really got the sense of the magnitude of this problem. And actually, so this is a picture by the road, one of the roadways that I took while picking up the garbage by a canoe on the left here. And what I discovered in my research was that Canada is actually especially bad for producing plastic waste. It actually produces more solid waste per capita than any other country in the world. And gar of course, solid waste encompasses garbage, sludge, or materials from treatment plants, etc. cetera. And, uh, but this garbage and waste that Canada is producing is thrown out, recycled, and in many cases thrown out the windows of vehicles or even dumped illegally, as I found while I was cleaning it up. As I found here in the picture, um, there was a lot of garbage on the shoreline. Yeah, so this was probably coming from people throwing it out of their window. And if this is not picked up, when high waters come in the springtime, much of this garbage flows further downstream and a lot of it ends up in our oceans. But if it ends up staying in our waterways on the shorelines, it slowly breaks down via UV exposure from the sun. And then it breaks down into microplastics. And then it eventually, then, this, then these microplastics have a much easier way of making its way down to the ocean as a suspended load in the rivers. There's a lot of, there's pretty limited research on the effects of plastics and microplastics in our freshwater ecosystems. So I was having a hard time finding, it was very obvious, especially with my research in the, in the ocean ecosystem, that there are a lot of harmful effects. But some of the, some of the effects that I did come across was for example, and accor uh, according to the Canadian Wildlife Foundation, researchers found polymer fibers and plastic pellets in the digestive tracts of fish in Lake Erie. When these fish absorb these microplastics or ingest the plastic particles, contaminants leach from these particles and cause liver, da liver damage. According, another one is according to National Geographic in 1960, Fewer than 5% of seabirds, which we have around here, even in our freshwater ecosystems, which is gulls, cormorants, terns, etc., were found to have plastic in their stomach, fewer than 5%. But in 1980, an estimated 80% of seabirds had plastic in their stomach, and now that number has risen to a staggering 90%. A recent study has found the decrease of seabird populations by uh, globally has been 67 percent from 1950 to 2010. So that's pretty staggering number. I wish I had more facts to share with you about this but like I said the research I, I did was hard to come by but uh, yeah I'll be definitely looking into this more and trying to track down more examples of this. So specifically regarding this, the seabird problem, here's an image of an albatross on a remote Pacific island showing how bad the, the problem of when 
of plastics are when they enter into the digestive tract of the seabirds. There are countless images you can find like this on the image or on the internet. They're quite graphic. So what happens when these plastics flow into our oceans is what we'll get into here now. So to give you an idea, a rough idea, there's an estimated 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic floating or resting on the bottom of the ocean. The Canadian government estimates that over 8 million tons of plastic flow into our oceans worldwide every year. And this is the equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic being dumped into the ocean every single minute. It's a pretty incredible amount. There has significant impacts on marine wildlife. For example, sea turtles that mistake a plastic bag floating in the water will eat it, or mistaking it for a jellyfish. They will consume it as food. These bags then cause intestinal blockages, preventing the turtles from being able to feed, leading to starvation. Only 22% of tur sea turtles who ingest just one um, piece of plastic will die, according to the World Wildlife Foundation. Plastic pollution in the ocean also causes some major issues for whales who are seeking a mouthful of, of plankton, but instead get a mouthful of plastics and microplastics. There are countless other example, examples, many of which are undiscovered of how marine wildlife fall victim to um, the issue of plastics in our oceans. And the plastic, the problem is only growing larger. Our plastic produ production has tripled since the 1990s. A Plastic Ocean is a great documentary for you to get a better idea of what the issue is. All right. So when I started looking into the solutions, my mind automatically went to recycling is a great uh, a great way to help keeping our or the responsible um, the responsible disposal of our plastics. And I thought, or I used to justify my plastic consumption just by saying it's going into recycling, it's okay. And I want to just, before I get into some of the ways that we actually can help, I want to get into why recycling might not be the best option for helping with our plastic problem. So according to the Canadian government and CBC in my research, 80 kilograms of plastic waste is produced per person per year in Canada, and only 9% of this gets recycled. Much of this 9%, which we are told gets recycled, either get, uh, gets up, get, ends up getting incinerated or placed in a landfill. And 17% of what we are told gets recycled actually gets exported legally or sometimes illegally to third world countries for recycling. And much of it, much of the recycling that we've exported to these countries is still sitting there and will probably never get used because it's way more that they, than they can possibly handle and therefore is pretty much a landfill. And in addition to this, when it's sent to third world countries, um, it is often processed dangerously by underpaid workers or gets illegally burned and emits toxic fumes and this creates a lot of challenges for surrounding communities. So this is, this is all to say that recycling might not be the best way to um, justify our using plastics and therefore I found the real solution is to figure out how we can reduce plastics as much as we could without relying on recycling. So here's some ways that we actually can help. As specifically with our food and drink packaging, we can focus on cutting out plastics as much as possible. And a couple ways we can do this, in the top right, I have a picture of mace, food in mason jars. So you can, if you are in Smith Falls, Modern Times is a, the Modern Times store is a great resource for 
classic free grocery shopping. If you're not in Smith Falls, then the bulk barn has a reusable container when when it gets started again. If if COVID-19 passes, then we'll be able to use that again, hopefully. The other way is to place pl pro um, place plastic produce, no, sorry, <laughs> place produce directly in our cart or use cloth bags. That's another way. And then another way is to avoid overpackaged foods such as soft drinks, juice boxes, or heavily packaged snacks such as granola bars. You can consider making your own snacks and consider using and putting them in containers and glass containers if you can. Definitely an easy way is to completely avoid using plastic water bottles. All this takes is just remembering to bring your reusable bottle and remembering to fill it up whenever you can. And then another way is to avoid fast food as much as possible. These foods are often heavily overpackaged and probably two thirds of everything that I ended up picking up or we ended up picking up in this uh, garbage cleanup project was fa fast food packaging and beer and soft drinks and energy, energy drink containers. Basically the food and drinks that you can pick up on the fly and then you can throw out your window. And of course, fast food has other health impacts other than its impacts on the environment. So another way that was mentioned was to limit online shopping and instead shop at local stores. Overpackaging is definitely a big problem for online shopping. I'll give you an idea. I got this package two weeks ago, which gives a pretty good idea. One second. So you can see this package goes up to my chest height, this box, and it's about that wide around, about the, the width of my hand stretched out. And inside, was the window film I ordered, this little mini box that was only this, this big. It's hard to give you an idea, but this one basically goes up to the, my waist. That will, this one goes up to my chest, and this was just placed inside and transported in this huge box. So these are of course often fully wrapped in bubble wrap in these big boxes that are bigger than what they need to be transported in. So an easy way to reduce this is to shop at our local stores. So these were the two ways that I focused on to prevent overwhelming with so much in info. I wanted to stick to what I felt were the most easy and effective ways to help reduce plastic consumption in our daily lives. But now what about preventing the plastics and garbage we do use from getting into our waterways. Well, one way is to get out there and pick up the garbage on our shorelines that do exist out there. There are many community garbage cleanup initiatives happening in many different areas. Or you can organize one yourself or you can just really go clean it, grab a garbage bag and just go pick it up because you'll be amazed or I was amazed when I got out there just in a very short amount of distance um, traveled, I could fill a full garbage bag. So it's pretty amazing. And another way is to make sure that we do not overflow our public garbage bins. This is very important because when the wind blows or the rain comes, all the Basically all the walkways, all the sidewalks, everything's designed so that every drop of rain that f falls onto our walkways and onto anything goes down, flows downhill into our storm sewers and then from our storm sewers into our rivers. So if there is overflow of garbage, if there is garbage on our street even, we can pick that up to help save plastics from entering our waterways because eventually a lot of this is going to end up in our waterways. So are there any questions so far? Keep in mind that I'm about to get into plastic microfibers in our synthetic clothing.
Hi, Jake. We have no questions so far. Okay. If you I, do have any uh, questions, oh, yeah. I could add a comment or two if you want, but if yeah. not, we'll let it go. Sure. Yeah, you've painted a very dramatic picture of how huge this problem is. It is worldwide and it's monstrous right now. There's a million uh, plastic water bottles consumed every minute worldwide. And in uh, Davos Economic Forum, a woman presented a paper saying, if we keep doing this in the ocean, by the year 2050, there'll be more plastics in the ocean than fish. This is huge. And of course, it affects our limited, our local waterways too. The question is, why is this happening? And there's a very important study coming out to say that the fossil fuel industry realizes that it's getting harder and harder to get people to burn their fossil fuels because of renewable energy sources and electric cars and things. And so they decided to turn it all into single-use plastics. And you go into your average store and you see everything's wrapped in plastic. So the problem is huge. And, and what to do, you, Jake, you've, you've given us all kinds of good ideas. I kind of sum it up like this. First, do something personally. Go back to glass, reusable glass. Go back to paper. Because paper, although it takes trees to grow it, it's biodegradable when you throw it in. <laughs> And also think of all kinds of reu reusable containers. But the main thing is, this problem is so big that even all of us doing our personal things will never attack it. We need government action. And the Canadian government, following the European Union, has decided to make an ultimate ban on single-use plastics. You know this, of course. Last year, up to the uh, date of December the 9th, they asked for suggestions. They came up with six things they were going to ban. And one of them was plastic straws, and one of them was plastic bags. That's a good idea. And but but the biggies weren't there, including the one marker for us is plastic water bottles because there's an alternative coming right out of the top. So we're, we 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 bombarded the Canadian government. And said, look, you've got to get more robust with your list of banned substances. By the way, I think it has to be a ban because trusting people to do it on their own, it's it's not going to happen. So the, the, the point of action is to encourage the Canadian government to do what they said they do. And they're now pondering how they should maybe make their list of banned single-use plastics more robust. We're waiting to see what they come up with. That's enough for me. Thank you, Eric. That is very valuable, a lot of very valuable information. Thank you very much. Okay, well... If anyone does have any questions, then you can post them in the chat and we can address them at the end. But for now, I'll get into our um, microplastics. So as part of my research for the shoreline cleanup project and doing my report on it, I discovered that microplastics and very specifically plastic microfibers coming off of our clothing was a big, big issue. And I especially, this was especially made obvious to me when I was picking up a carpet to put in the garbage bag that had basically, that was basically disintegrating in my hands. There were thousands, if not millions of little microfibers in the soil and would have, which would have been in the waterway already. And I was doing my best to pick up these chunks of carpet and put it in the garbage bag, but there was no way I was going to be able to get them all. And it was really opened my eyes to, wow, just like, this is what our synthetic materials are disintegrating into. And I can only imagine what these microscopic um, plastic pieces are doing to the ecosystems when they get in there. And again, the research is just so limited, especially on our freshwater ecosystems of what this does. All right. So yeah, and of course, many of these microplastics will flow into our oceans. So to give you an idea, I'm going to focus on oceans right now because that's where most of the research I could find was. We all know, we've all heard of that big plastic patch twice the size of Texas in the Pacific Ocean. It's actually mostly a plastic soup partly from plastics breaking, or sorry, a microplastic soup, partly uh, an, an account to 
plastics breaking down from UV exposure, but also significantly from microplastics flowing into the ocean and flowing there via ocean currents. So what are these impacts of the microplastics in our oceans? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So what are the impacts of the microplastics in our oceans? Well, one big one is, one huge one, is microplastics inhibit phytoplankton's ability to photosynthesize. The process which creates oxygen and sequesters carbon is photosynthesis. So phytoplankton are the main primary producers. They pay, play a key role in the production of oxygen on our planet. Primary producers in the ocean account for a whopping 80% of the world's oxygen. And again, phytoplankton are the main primary producers. They're also responsible for 45% of the world's carbon fixation. However, when exposed to microplastics, research has shown that phytoplankton's rate of photosynthesis decreases by 45%, largely due to the light not being able to reach them. In the Western Mediterranean Sea, there's a one to two ratio of plastic to plankton. And much of this plastic is in the form of microplastics. So there's, and of course, there's a lot of phytoplankton in um, our freshwater ecosystems as well. But this, uh, this example of the ocean, there's a lot more in the ocean, which is creating a lot more um, of our world's oxygen. To give you an idea of where these plastic, of where these microplastics are coming from in the ocean, they're coming all the microplastics which go directly into the ocean, which aren't big plastics that break down, come from 35% our clothing, and then the next big one, 28% is tires, and the easiest way to, and this is comes automatically when our tires wear little particles will then go onto the road which when it rains again they just flow downhill into our waterways and into the oceans and the easiest way to mitigate uh, excess tire wear is to keep them properly inflated and drive our cars less it's just uh, another reason yet to reduce travel if and when possible and then there's city dust road markings ship paint chips and personal care products as well. So to give you an idea of the issue of microplastics in our stormwater runoff, like I was alluding to before, this was one really shocking study that I found conducted by Environment International, which basically took eight square, one square meter samples on top of a nine story building in London. And they observed how many pieces of microplastics fell from the air onto the top of this nine-story building. And what they found was between 575 and 1,008 pieces of microplastics fell from the sky onto the top of this nine-story building. And most of these plastics which were falling were coming from our clothes. And 8% an of these materials were common uh, common plastics found in food packaging. And of course, like I said, every raindrop that falls onto oh, no, the top- I'm in a zoom. Like I said, every raindrop eight. that falls onto the top of this um, building and every raindrop that falls onto uh, the roadway, the sidewalks and everything will flow downstream, will flow downhill into our storm sewers, into our waterways. And like I mentioned before, a direct effect of these microplastics on our freshwater ecosystems that the Canadian Wildlife Foundation found was the polymer fibers and plastic pellets in the digestive tracts of fish in Lake Erie. And when the fish absorb these microplastics or ingest the plastic particles, contaminants leach from these particles and can cause and cause liver damage. So yeah, I would have liked to speak more on the issues of microplastics, but I'm excited to see what kind of research comes out in the, or I don't know if I can say excited, but I, I would like more research to see what the effects are. All right, so in order to address this microplastics issue, 
we really need to take a look at our clothing, which is accounting for 35% of all the microplastics flowing into our waterways and oceans. And here is a breakdown of the materials that I found in my own home, which were really actually very, very close to an accurate representation of what most people's um, clothing is composed of. So here on the left, we have 100% synthetic, which is nylon, polyester, spandex materials. Um, on, the, on the right, there is the natural, which is wool or cotton and the mix in between. And after I weighed it all and calculated all the percentages and did a, a total overview, it ended up that by weight, all my clothes put together was around 55% synthetic materials and the average um, for the average for most people is 60%. So if you take a look in your own wardrobe and your own clothing stash, what you'll probably find is around 60% of synthetic materials, unless you've already been on top of this before. But I certainly wasn't. I wasn't conscious of the effects of these. So like I said before, synthetic clothing materials consist of polyester, which most most often makes fleece, nylon, spandex, acrylic, etc. And these materials are made from oil and they come from the refining process like all plastics. Many harmful chemicals are released during the synthetic microfiber or the synthetic clothing material production, which also poses a pretty big risk to our waterways as well. But I won't I won't get into that. Now these these not only go out into the air, but they also pose a big issue when we are washing our clothes. To give you an idea, for an average load of laundry, which is around six kilograms, over 700,000 pieces of plastic microfibers can be released per wash. These then flow into our waterways and eventually into our into our oceans and according to the United Nations environmental program laundry accounts for 500,000 tons of microfibers flowing into the oceans every single year and this is because water treatment plants release up to 40% of these microfibers um, into our rivers lakes and oceans these microfibers are then often eaten by aquatic creatures and of course entering the food web and we often eat those creatures which are eating those microfibers which I uh, which is very apparent that we're lacking a lot of research in the effects of that as well. So now we've got an idea of what the problem is with our synthetic clothing materials and like before I want to get into what are some of the sustainable alternatives but in order to um, be able to get into that, I want to first get into what we think would be a good option, but actually turns out isn't the best option for other reasons, which is cotton, which brings up another uh, big problem, um, which is water overconsumption. And this is especially a big problem in water scarce parts of the world. It is very important that we reduce water consumption um, in these areas specifically. Um, compared to Canada, although Canada certainly does not have an endless supply of water. But some areas are facing some major challenges like the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan has been mostly lost due to water diversion and is suspected that the main reason for this is the production of cotton. And this is according to the United Nations. According to the World Wildlife Foundation, an estimated 97% of the Indus River, which flows from which flows through China, India, and Pakistan, has been diverted mainly for cotton production, according to the World Wildlife Foundation. I realize I didn't spend quite enough time to really be able to see what this graphic shows here, but this is the coastline in uh, 1960. In the top left of the Aral Sea and you can see how it's gradually shrunk into almost nothing by 2009. So 
I certainly don't want to overwhelm people with all of the things that we can't buy. That is not my intention here. It's just that when I was looking into what are the sustainable alternatives, I found that cotton, well, we might need to look into an alternative to cotton because one cotton t-shirt takes about 2,720 liters to create. One pair of jeans takes around 10,500 liters of water to create. And according to the World Wildlife Foundation, conventional practices for cotton involve the application of a substantial amount of, fer of uh, artificial fertilizers and pesticides um, compared to many other crops or most other crops. And then runoff from these pest pesticides, fertilizers, and minerals from cotton fields contaminate our waterways, wetlands, and underground aquifers and affect those ecosystems. So now let us look at what are the sustainable alternatives to our synthetic clothing materials. And what I found was organic cotton, now this obviously doesn't handle the water consumption, which I showed you there, although I did find that they weren't organic cotton wasn't necessarily being produced in these specific areas that I just showed you. It is still requires a substantial amount of water to produce, but um, it does handle the very large amount of pesticides according to the World Wildlife Foundation. So, but this is definitely the cheapest of sustainable alternatives that I found, and it does definitely effectively um, eliminate plastic microfibers from flowing into our waterways. And then the other one that I found was merino wool. Now the reason I have all of this um, carbon emission information on this slide is because many people believe that the carbon emissions from sheep is an issue so you should avoid buying wool. But when I looked into it I found that this wasn't the case when it was compared with other clothing materials. Sure, it was a little bit more, but in order to save, um, in order to save my plastic microfibers from going into the oceans, it really, it, I found that it really wasn't that much. So to give you an idea, a typical medium merino wool long sleeve shirt um, weighs around 175 grams and emits around 7.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions that is taking into account methane and and multiplying it for how many more times that that uh, is more impactful than CO2. A typical active wear men's medium t-shirt made of polyester weighs around 120 grams and much of that material or, or sorry and that material emits around 5.5 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions in weight. And then a men's medium cotton t-shirt weighs around 155 grams and that emits around 4.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. So it turns out that sheep don't actually emit that much more carbon emissions for one kilogram of wool material compared to any other one. And to give you an idea of why I am using a men's medium t-shirt here is because while well, I have a plethora of men's medium t-shirts in my own clothing stock, so I could just weigh it and average it out the easiest that way. So merino wool, I found was a really good alternative. I like wearing this for active wear when it's not too hot outside. And uh, I found that it was a really good, really good option. And it's very comfortable and wool as well in general. So then other ones include linen. Linen tends to have a low water consumption and very low carbon emissions. Hemp has very low water consumption and very low carbon emissions, as well as silk. Now, linen and hemp are fantastic options. They're very strong materials, really, really comfortable and really effective and very environmentally friendly. They can be a little bit harder to find. And one thing you do need to watch out for is greenwashing because many companies will just put hemp in their title and you'll look at, their, at the um, 
how much percentage of it is actually hemp and it'll end up being like 15% hemp. Meanwhile, they're putting hemp in the title, but hemp is a great option. And there's a lot of online stores, which would, um, which would, uh, yeah, provide those clothing materials. And then there's Tencel, which is trademarked by the name Lyocell. Um, these are made from wood pulp. So they come from usually from well-managed forest and it's easy to find and is a good sustainable options with medium carbon emissions. But of course it's, it's really good for um, keeping those plastic microfibers out. One thing that we do want to avoid according to my research was viscose, which is often called rayon. And that's just because it requires a, a very substantial amount of chemical treatment. And a lot of this chemical treatment can cause some issues for our waterways. So other than that, these are kind of the, yeah, the sustainable alternatives and what the issue is with our plastics in our waterways. So please think about what are the most easy and effective options that you can implement in your own life and then do share them in our in our journey into Rito Environmental Action League's Journey to Sustainable Living group. And that you can share in there your biggest takeaways from the presentation. If there are any other important things that you think people should know that I didn't cover in our Plastics in Our Waterways presentation, and, and what you will do, whether that's reducing plastic while grocery shopping, reducing online shopping, switching to natural fiber clothing, or anything else you think is a really effective way to reduce plastics, uh, plastic consumption and help our waterways from, with the plastic issue. All right. So are there any questions? Regarding the information I put in there. I, I would like to just again make a few comments. So the problem is clothing because a lot of it's synthetic made from fossil fuels and when they are thrown away they break up and they have microplastics everywhere. So we should go to natural materials like cotton and linen and others because at least when they biodegrade they do not cause an environmental problem. But you might say it takes so much water to grow these things. Well, if we, that's water used for irrigation worldwide. 80% of all the water worldwide is used for irrigation. It's a huge consumer of water. How about if we reduce the amount of cotton and other natural uh, sources of clothing um, and did it only where you didn't need so much irrigation? Now we get to the real crux of the problem. The clothing industry wants you to keep buying new clothes and throwing and hardly ever using your present ones and get, getting rid of them. That we, we, are, we are wearing too many clothes and changing too, much, too often. I spent eight years in Africa and what they tend to do there and what I tend to do, I had a shirt, I just kept wearing it and wearing it until it got so ragged it fell off me. Uh, I, I suspect if somebody did a study to see the overconsumption of clothes, especially if they're synthetic, is a huge part of the problem. Now, how do you get people to suddenly use the same clothes over and over and over and over again until they're so worn out they throw them away? That's a big cultural problem, but I, I, I think there's, there's some kind of a... I don't know how you get people to do that, especially in a free market enterprise where they can do what they want with their money and their clothes, but... I think the overconsumption of synthetic clothes <laughs> is part of the problem. And we could change that. If it's not easy, we would be would be onto something. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I definitely I found that fast fashion was incredible. Something like the average American buys, I think it was 68 new articles of clothing every year. It's really mind-boggling that number and to think of yeah most of this is synthetic material so thank you for bringing that up yeah i had to think about for the sake of time how much information i wanted to include but thank yeah. you for bringing that up because it's a big issue definitely do a whole workshop just on fast fashion alone that's a very good point eric thank you for bringing that up i do have some questions from the chat jake okay so the first one from Vanessa, how can we take microfibers from water? Yeah, 
that's uh <laughs> that's one that's got me stumped i don't i'm not even sure if we have any ideas of how to do that effectively at this point does anyone else have any comments on that i i have a few um a few things that are uh, that are in play right now okay um so mainly uh at water treatment plants the problem is that they they're simply not set up to deal with the sheer volume um, that would be coming through. So, and again, this ends up, I like it's not an ideal situation, but the the with the solution that we have right now is, or what's available to us, I should say, right at this moment, is that um, it, it ends up getting put on the consumer again, unfortunately. But if you are someone who regularly wears like active wear and things like that, that it's really hard to get away from there being synthetics in the mix. There are some things that you can buy um, to put in the laundry when you're washing those clothes. Um, one of them is actually uh, branded as the guppy and you put it in with the clothes or you put the clothes in it. Um, there's others bags and that as well that you can like laundry bags that you put in the clothes in before you put them in the wash and it is fine enough that the water and soap and that can pass through it so the clothes get washed but it's collecting those microplastics and microfibers and then at the end you just simply turn it inside out and then you can dispose of them properly failing that if it's you know something an extra step like that is too much for you. There are microfilters that you can get to put on the back of your washing machine where the, you know, like where the, where the out valve is, my words are failing me. Um, but there's a, there's a microfilter that you can actually get to install on the back of your washing machine. And it can take care of that at a much smaller volume level. Now, if we, if, Ideally, if that could be scaled up quite a lot to be used in a water treatment plant, that would be great. Um, but as of right now, they're only really available on the, you know, the, the size that a consumer could use them. At, so like one load at a time kind of thing. So there are some options out there for people that, you know, ideally we don't want to be just going through and, and chucking things out because they're not fitting the criteria because then of course we're wasting things so it's better for us to give them the longest life that we can now and if we know that it's something that's really durable and we're going to have it for a long time those are some options that we can put into play to keep that you know to make a disconnect so they're not making it out of our house out of the washing machine as well so. okay uh, I want to say I had taught water treatment and I took our students through the water treatment plants here at Ottawa a number of times as part of the course. The problem is this, these microplastics, some of them are so small that to get rid of them, you would have to do extremely expensive filtering, uh, or reverse osmosis, ionizing, and this would be so costly that it's impossible. So in fact, uh, it's a lot of these very, very small microplastics go right through our water treatment plant. We can't get rid of them. And therefore they're everywhere. In fact, the interesting thing is we have microplastics in our bodies right now. And so do most fish and animals. They're still not dead clear what the long-term effects of this is going to be. We don't see any measurable diseases out of them yet, but we're pretty sure that if this keeps up, we're going to get some long-term effects. This is a huge problem. And, and really, it's better to stop it at the source than to try and get rid of it once it's in the water. It is a very complicated, costly process to get rid of these microscopically small microplastics. And therefore, it's not really done. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you Jake, for that. we have one more question in the chat from Sydney, and she is wondering if you could tell us more about your role as a restoration specialist. What do you do and what do you love most about your work? Yeah, so as the, as the riparian restoration specialist, I've definitely in, it really enjoyed this shoreline cleanup project. It was really a joy to get out there and help help our waterways um, from the plastics, but also in coordinating the shoreline naturalization project, um, like in helping coordinate it with all these moving pieces, I've really enjoyed um, 
learning about the effects or, or doing all of this research on how the shoreline naturalization project um, will benefit our waterways and the effects of these plastics and how we can really help. So I think that what I've enjoyed the most is being able to uh, now, as I'm nearing the end of it, being able to look back on everything that I've done and being able to look back on everything that I've put together and just see how I'm doing everything that I can anyway to help help our waterways and feeling that impact, it feels really good. Uh, Jake, just give them a 30 second uh, recap of what you're doing in Smith Falls for shoreline restoration. Yeah, so we're... Um, we're looking to implement a shoreline uh, planting project this coming May of 2021 in Smith Falls as a public public demonstration site for to inspire the public in the area or to inspire the local people in the area to implement a shoreline naturalization of their uh, project of their own. And so I'm also doing some research on the uh, on the benefits of this and I'm going to be doing a presentation which will be my next slide once we're done the questions on the on the um, benefits of shoreline naturalization and how they can help mitigate the effects of climate change in the future. Are there any other questions? And Jay, would you be needing any volunteers and so on when you get to actual planting? Oh, yes, <laughs> for sure. We will be needing volunteers. So, um, yeah, I'll explain more on the details about this next Thursday in our presentation. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be needing volunteers to help out with this planting project if, if uh, COVID-19 restrictions allow for us to go forward with it as planned in May of 2021. Um, Anita had a question about uh, septic systems. If you have um, and microplastics and, and maybe Eric is in a better position to answer that. Um, so would a septic system filter out microplastics? Probably not, it's a gravel. But anyhow, Eric, do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> No, it wouldn't. A septic system is using a natural biological uh, process, microbes, to chew up the, <laughs> the material and, and make it biodegradable and safer. But it, it won't attack the, uh, the microplastics. They'll go right through that system. Uh, I, the trouble is that fossil fuel materials are not easily biodegradable. They've been in the, in the Earth's crust for billions of years <laughs> and developing, and they're not going to biodegrade very quickly. They just are not biodegradable, whereas recently grown things are biodegradable. So that's it. Mm. So I, I just had one comment, and I put it on the chat, but I don't know if it actually went out there. We always talk about the effects of plastics on our waters and in the ocean. And for us living here in Ottawa, Smith Falls, the ocean is much closer than we think. Like it takes a drop of water about five to seven days to go from Ottawa to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That's all. Uh, how long it takes that drop to go from Smith Falls to Ottawa probably depends how much boat traffic there is. But, you know, it's a very tangible connection from us to the Atlantic Ocean. When you throw a, whatever goes in the water here is going to get eaten by a blue whale very soon. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Max, can I ask you a personal question? How did you do the, the Ottawa Kingston uh, in 22 hours? Did you do it by canoe? Yeah, I did it with the world champion uh, marathon canoe racer, uh, female, Boy. Joanna, Joanna Falloon, who still lives uh, in locally. <laughs> So, yeah, we, it was done very, like, you know, we had people meeting us at the lock stations to feed us and throw water bottles at us. And <laughs> it was very professionally done. I was a lot younger. <laughs> I was in the back, so I so she couldn't get ahead of me. She was we were attached by a canoe. <laughs> and it's a specialized racing canoe. Like, this canoe goes like stink. It, it took me four days, for Pete's sake. <laughs> Four days is pretty good. That's pretty yeah, fast. Yeah, we slept at night. I don't know. Did you get much sleep? You were canoeing? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no you sleep. didn't? Oh, That's my fine. word. <laughs> good for you. 
So are there any last questions or should I move on? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, great. So other than that, I'll just mention our next presentation will be regarding shoreline naturalization, specifically taking a look at the future impacts of climate change on our local waterways and how can shoreline naturalization help, help mitigate and adapt to these um, issues which climate change presents and these changes that climate change will present to our waterways. And then we'll look at how to undertake your own shoreline naturalization project if that's uh, available to you, but we'll also be talking about our project um, coming in May. And of course we will need volunteers for this. So if you can, um, yeah, we'll let you know about all the details. So this will be next Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. And to, reg for, to register for this, you can use the same link, um, just check check back in tomorrow evening and I'll say tomorrow I'm going to be sh changing this link to be applicable to our, our shoreline naturalization um, presentation. You can actually register tomorrow and I'll still get you in there. So yeah, other than that, here are the references for the presentation that I used. A lot of um, the information or the sources that I took this information from. If you do want a copy of this presentation, just to double check my sources where I got this information from or do a little bit of research on your own, there's certainly a lot more information um, on these sources than I could possibly have time for to talk about in a presentation. So if you want more info, I can send you the presentation or you can email me if anything comes to mind. Um, just respond to the email that I sent out to you for the information to join the Zoom meeting. So other than that. Yeah, and, uh, and also, also too, there is a curriculum link to the plastics issue. Uh, that's from grade six to 12. And maybe, uh, Bill, would you like to uh, say a bit more about this? Sorry, he couldn't hear. Yeah, that's okay. He may I, be muted. If people are interested, Peter, if anybody's interested, yes, there are there are links in the curriculum to to the plastics presentation and the and the shoreline. So, uh, if anybody's interested in that, they can get in touch with us. Jake, I think, has a copy of the chart, and I can certainly talk to somebody more about that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's everything for on my end. So thank you We're very now... much for for listening to this presentation and coming out to it. I really appreciate it.